Pascal, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Pascal Glor. <laughs> you have to try that, especially the Dutch guys. Um, I'm a principal network and system architect. Uh, I've been working in the field for too long. Uh, <laughs> I work for uh, Quickline, uh, which is the second largest cable operator in Switzerland. Uh, we're much smaller than the largest. That would be UPC. Um, but still, we have about 200,000 cable modems. Um, today, I'm going to... This presentation is going to be about some technical stuff, some legal stuff, but at the end, it's all about humans because, I mean, why do we do all of this? This is for us, for the customer and for the people. So technical stuff is nice, but at the end, the whole service is for, for people. Um, I'd like to add some important points here that this presentation is not about that. Uh, nature is it about that one, <laughs> and most importantly, that one. <laughs> but if you really insist, I can consult. If you delete everything, there is nothing to worry about. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a story that happened to us, um, which then follows a, uh, followed by an investigation and some lawful intercept stuff. Some people know me and know that I do like lawful intercept. Well, like is maybe not the right word. Uh, I'm interested by the legal aspect of things. And at the end, well, the lessons learned. What, what we did wrong and what we should do better. So the story. So it always starts with tickets, right? So they go on first level and then they go to second level and, and they got stuck there and then there is another ticket and there were four, five, six tickets coming in that uh, our customer weren't able to send emails to Swisscom, which is the former monopoly in Switzerland. And um, so a lot of mail go there. Um, so at the end, it, it finally escalated to, uh, to the engineering team where we found out that Swisscom blacklisted us. So that's interesting. Usually ISPs don't blacklist each other. So um, we started talking with them. I found out the guy and called the guy and he said, well, we got mass spam, scam, whatever coming from you. I said, well, yeah, just us. I mean, is that not like a new trend or something? I said, no, 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 no. That's very specific on an IP range. I was like, that's odd. So, um, okay. Uh, I don't see the next slide. Uh, <laughs> so that was on a very specific IP range. And uh, we do um, cable, but we also do FTTH uh, and DSL. So, and they have different IP ranges. So uh, this was the, the FTTH one. So we're like, this is, this is really odd, because um, um, this can only um, be uh, attributed, it couldn't be like a Trojan on the clients, because it would be spread everywhere around, and also from other networks, and not only from us, and not only from FTTH. So to have an idea of the, um, of the setup, this is a typical setup you're going to have. Um, you have the uh, customer CP, uh, V4 with NAT, V6 routed, uh, then you got the layer 2 aggregation uh, for the physical layer, and then we do um, uh, pseudo wire and the central aggregation on a BRAS or BNG or whatever, depending on your vendor, uh, for uh, AAA, and then goes the EVL internet. Um, so the IP range uh, is on the BRAS, and then all the customers are within that or those ranges. Um, that's our nice CP. It's had nice software on it. Um, and <laughs> so we started investigating. Um, uh, we knew that it had something to do with FTTH. 
So obviously it was not originated from the customer. Uh, so we started digging. Um, we started looking at NetFlow. Um, couldn't find anything interesting. We started to use uh, uh, monitoring interfaces uh, and yeah, simply TCP dump a few gig of traffic, uh, try to some, find something suspect in it. And we didn't find anything. Um, we continued uh, and finally we went on the CPEs and um, it has some kind of CLI and um, uh, you don't have really have a shell but it's kind of like a proprietary shell and you have some comments because it's, it's basically a Linux so uh, we found some netstat and then we saw well nothing interesting so it was really odd and good to figure out I mean, clearly the, the, the spam and the scam and whatever email traffic uh, was coming out of the ECP, we, we couldn't find the origin. Um, and that's the problem, assumptions. The first thing we excluded when we looked at NetFlow, when we looked at the actual traffic, also when we looked at the, um, the NetStat, is we excluded all the SSH attempt because yeah, I mean, that's the most scanned port, right? And there are so many bots brute forcing SSH all the time. It's the first thing you exclude because, yeah, that's normal traffic, right? So that's exactly the problem. That was not based on a fact. That was based on assumption. So we made that assumption that SSH had to be excluded because we know what's, doing, what's going on there. So we didn't take uh, SSH into consideration which was a mistake. It was SSH, but did they find our password? It was like some long random string that was, well, not impossible, but very unlikely. So um, what we found out was very interesting. Uh, when you SSH that CPE, you get your SSH password prompt. We never did a negative testing there, because why would you? You expect the wrong password not to work, right? But then we tried. You just press enter. And then instead of having the SSH prompt back, you got this weird shell login coming. See that one coming? So that was weird. And then if you add a few options, like SOX proxy, well, that one works. Because as soon as SSH will give you the shell login, SSH is actually established. So all the options, like port forwarding, SOX proxy, will actually work. Then one of our colleagues found that after a few minutes, your session will actually time out, which is not very nice. So, but if you add the do not execute remote command option, then you don't get a shell. So that's even cooler because then your session just hangs and your SOX proxy stays open. So what happened there? This is your positive testing. You got the SSH client, the SSH daemon on the CP, uh, you send your password, uh, some PAM, uh, a known authentication uh, service on the CP will uh, say, well, the password's correct, and will give the shell back, whatever the shell is. Um, if you do it wrong, well, the authentication mechanism will notice that the password is wrong, but instead of rejecting the login, gives you like slash bin slash login. Um, which for SSH means a positive answer. For SSH, it means it's good. You don't get the shell, you get like the login shell, but SSH-wise, you're established. Um, and then you do the same, but you instruct SSH to uh, not execute any remote commands, which was the like minus uh, capital N option then the PAM-like mechanism will tell, well, it's fine, and yeah, we don't need anything, so 
it's just stuck there. So what was the cause? Well, the first cause is SSH was open to the world, which was a mistake. Um, it was a configuration mistake. Um, we misunderstood something in the documentation about the firewall. We misunderstood the principle of firewalling the device and firewalling the customer traffic. And it got mixed up in the documentation and we didn't understand it correctly. We didn't check it either. So SSH was open. It was not intended, but it was open. And I mean, it was like that for maybe two years until someone found out. Um, I guess that after this presentation, many bots will now check for that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, interesting thing, we opened a ticket indeed at the uh, vendor telling the proxy thing, and while well, they said it works as, as expected. So that's interesting. Um, I don't expect CPs to do, uh, have that kind of functions. Um, well, you could, you could use it as VPN, right? Um, <laughs> back home. <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, they have, uh, they have fixed it. So, well, we corrected the CP settings and we fixed the issue. Um, it was not abused anymore, so everything's nice, right? Mm, yay! Not quite. Well, we didn't have to wait long until we get the first request regarding data retention. Because in that whole flow that went through the SOX proxies, I mean, that was not only spam, that was a lot of stuff there. And a lot of stuff that triggered complaint and uh, resulted in legal issues. So in Switzerland, we have this law called BUPF in German and LSCPT in French, uh, which is the federal law about telecommunication surveillance. And that one requires us to keep six months of track to who had which IP uh, and when. Um, this is our edited record. Uh, and you see, there are not that much requests. This is just like the that was a few months ago. Um, so we got with this web UI and we get uh, an uh, email notification telling we have a new request. We log in there and we have the request. We fill in the data and that's it. Uh, there is also an automated uh, API which we don't use. Uh, we don't have that much request. So that's, that's the normal flow. You see, it's, it's, it's a handful of months. Yeah, we get hundreds. Um, a few days after we fixed the, uh, the SOX proxy, we got hundreds of requests. Um, that was a real issue um, because we knew it was not the customer's fault. Um, so what we tried to contact the, uh, the um, intelligence, uh, Melanie, which is uh, responsible for uh, critical infrastructure and, and stuff like that, and they said, well, it's a surveillance stuff, it's not our responsibility. And the UP guys, which are the guy in the federal government responsible for uh, surveillance, they said, well, it's the law, you, you just have to answer. And I said, well, we know the customer is not responsible, yeah, but, you know, it's the law, you have to answer. It's like, where is your brain, guys? Um, so, <laughs> so the best thing we we could think of at that point is there is a comment file field which we can use when we send the, uh, the answers. Legally, we have to reply, but we comment on every request for FTTH for that term, time period. The whole thing lasts maybe, I think, uh, two or three weeks, um, the, uh, the abuse uh, um, time span. Um, we used the comment field to, uh, to, to explain what was going on and, and the likeliness that the customer was not responsible for, that, for those actions, whatever those were. Um, so the lessons learned, well, don't deploy in a hurry. I know that's kind of hard. Um, usually you got like the product managers or uh, 
the CTO or whoever is putting pressure to deploy as fast as possible, especially like new CPs or stuff, like a quick sport, port scan, that's not going to cost a lot. I mean, that would have saved us this. If we would have noticed that 22 was open from the world, I mean, that was not our intention. So um, it was a misconfiguration, but we didn't check. Uh, neither did we do any negative checking, like what happens if you put the wrong password, because why would you? You test if it's working, not if it's not working, right? Um, the legal lesson, yeah. I, I tried, uh, so I know this lawyer, which is specialized in telecommunication in Switzerland, and uh, he explained to me what the situation is. I tried to translate that for you. So, <laughs> The problem is if there is any chance that this criminal act could have been done by the customer, you have to reply. If you're 100% sure that it cannot be the customer, then you could, in theory, not reply and, well, then go to court and defend your case. Because they're going to they're gonna bring you to court if you don't reply. So that's tricky because nobody wants to go to court um, to defend one customer. So the problem here is these customers, they were using their access while they were abused. So it's in theory possible that any of these crimes could have actually been done by the customer. So which means we, had, we couldn't do anything. Luckily, that kind of proof is usually not enough to bring you uh, to court. It just like might trigger an investigation from, uh, from the police. Uh, they have some log, they want to find out who it is, but that's not enough to do something actually. So uh, we do actually hope that um, none of our customers were harmed, but honestly, I don't know. Um, plan breaches. Also, we were surprised. We had no idea how to deal with this. We were completely focused on the technical aspect of it because we're engineers. So we had this issue and we find the issue, we fix the issue, solved, right? And we didn't even think further. So inform the public, not necessarily, but if you, might, if you think that might be useful, yes. But inform the affected customer. Um, at least that. We didn't do that. I would do that now. Uh, because these might have triggered investigation. Some of the police force understood the case and uh, they, uh, they called us to actually understand more about it and they understood they couldn't do anything about these crimes. Um, so they, they had to give up but, uh, or, or just use other paths than a, than a technical path uh, for their investigation. Um, Usually, if like, you know, like some people, they use stolen credit cards and they buy stuff online and they'll deliver at home. It's, you don't need surveillance for that. <laughs> Just track the package. Um, informing the affected customer, that, that would have been nice, yeah. That's, that's really, for me, the, uh, the lesson learned on the non-technical uh, aspect of the thing. Well, that was it. Do you have any questions, comments, remarks? Hi, uh, Remy from Agem. Um, so you did stuff to fix the problem and everything. Did you also put anything in place to detect if something like this would ever happen? I understand it's, it's hard to see if I know someone's using a proxy to order drugs off the internet, whatever. But if someone's sending out mass spam, surely you should be able to see that in your NetFlow. Mm. And no, from, not from always, like, because like the, NetFlow, a, the NetFlow might not give you enough of that, especially in the whole amount of traffic. Uh, what I didn't tell is that cable is about 90% of our customers, FTTH 10%. So even a massive change in the patterns of one side might not be seen. You might not see it in the whole thing. Okay. And also, yeah, 
you could analyze stuff, but usually these NetFlow analyzer, you need to tell them what you want to analyze because they can't keep everything. And well, you can't add more boxes. <laughs> <laughs> cloud. <laughs> yeah, cloud. Right. <laughs> Blockchain. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering about that myself. Uh, you said that, that basically the detection mechanism was that one of the competing providers started blocking and then your customers started working their way through the support system. Yeah. And that sounds uh, somewhat inefficient. Uh, inefficient. Um, in the Dutch community, a project originated, abuse.io, mm -hmm. which is a software that you can use to uh, automatically correlate abuse reports which you received from the competing party uh, with your customer base and perhaps you should use that system and enrich it with firmware versions and models and yeah that only works if they use it right um, as if you publish an abuse email address and they send stuff to it then you yeah often okay. can parse it yeah yeah well the the blocking was automatic so <laughs> ah. Uh, do, you, do you know of any ways to improve on the detection for this particular uh, type of problem? Yeah, machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's exactly the problem. You would have to make like profiles of your traffic and then start to have a system that would detect if something like fundamentally changes. But any abuse doesn't mean big volume or a lot of connection. These connections, they might have been long-term connection. I mean, you can just keep them open forever. Um, SSH is not unusual. In the amount of connection or amount of volume, uh, SSH before versus during the abuse, I'm not sure you would have seen the difference. Because SSH, uh, is abused all the time, is scanned all the time, and because of the uh, uh, encryption negotiation, you have some kind of volume. Uh, spam isn't big volume. Yep. So you might not even have seen that. It, it's kind of tricky sometimes. Sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it just hides in, in the volume. And, you know, the, the delta isn't big enough. Erik Barish, ATB Internet. Uh, so the trigger for Swisscom to block you was spam. Yeah. And you're not blocking, uh, sending all uh, outgoing emails for customers through uh, mail SMTP relay servers? Yeah, yeah, but the, the blocked mails from those source IPs, not from the connection source IP, from the client IP, mm -hmm. relay through our servers. So, so they check the headers. Yeah. And they take the, the actual source IP, mm -hmm. and they blocked all emails from those. So they didn't block the relays. That's kind of nice of them, yeah. in your case. <laughs> yeah, it, but it makes more sense, right? I mean, if you have a, a, a mail server that's just only sending spam, you can just block it. But um, between ISPs, you try not to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they're doing classification based on the... Uh, on, on the actual client IP address. Yeah, but uh, so your CPEs can actually send email out directly to the internet and not are not forced through a mail relay server for outgoing send email. No, they use our relays. Yeah, so they should have caught this, right? Our emails? Your mail servers, your wait, mail relay wait, server. Wait, 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 wait. So no, no, your, no, that's, your that's not right. The the they send it directly. Yes. So they send it directly to so uh, that to could have caught it. Our relays were not part of it. Sorry, yes. I was confused by that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Bart Schanken from Abusio, but I don't have a uh, <laughs> remark about the project itself. But on the detection side, um, um, based on trend intelligence, uh, it's still a successful logon on the modem that is in your management. And if the customer isn't allowed to log on onto the modem, then the high amount of um, uh, logons on SSH might have triggered an alert if you monitor the net. Well, the customers are not allowed on the CPEs. Uh, 
So right. if you if you monitor those uh, low one events, then you see a high event of low. Yeah, ones. yeah, yeah. I mean, SSH should not have been open at all. Um, and if we would have looked at the net flow, uh, we would probably have seen that there were successful TCP uh, SSH connection. That should not have been. Yeah. That's right. But logging it would have helped as well. Hmm? Hey, hindsight yeah, is 2020. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, Pascal, I think uh, it's, it's uh, really courageous that you stand here and offer a transparent overview of what transpired. Uh, most companies prefer not to talk about uh, security-related incidents, so uh, for this reason, I appreciate your yeah. being here all the more. You, you, can, you can thank the CEO because... Uh, 